everybody. I think we are about ready to go ahead and get started with our next installment of this uh, webinar series that we're doing called the Microsoft 365 Certified Developer. Today, we're gonna be covering Microsoft Teams. Um, I just wanna do a quick check and make sure that everyone can both see me and hear me. And if you would, just raise your hand so that I can see you um, and the Zoom chat to make sure that you can both see and hear me, which you can, absolutely fantastic. All right, so let's go ahead and let's get started. Um, again, my name is Andrew Connell, um, and today we're gonna to be going through Microsoft Teams, um, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, uh, what you need to know to get certified for uh, uh, the Microsoft 365 certification. For developers, we're gonna focus on Microsoft Teams. Now, before we go into this too, too much, I wanna uh, first start and talk a little bit, explain who I am really quick, just give you a brief overview. Um, my name is Andrew Connell. Uh, I'm a technically an office development MVP. I've been doing SharePoint development now for, oh my goodness, a very, 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 very long time, about 17 years. Um, and I'm also on the core team for the Patterns and Practices group uh, with Microsoft 365 Dev. Um, I do uh, spend a lot of time in the SharePoint development uh, repository, maintaining our issue list and uh, addressing questions that come in and triaging them and stuff like that. I have a podcast uh, that we release weekly episodes um, related to Microsoft 365 and Azure topics. And then I have a training business as well, where I focus on SharePoint framework development. Um, and in the SharePoint, Deve SharePoint framework development um, category, I guess, uh, I've got a course called Mastering the SharePoint Framework. Uh, for uh, developers to get up to speed on the SharePoint framework. I actually released a new chapter for that course yesterday to the Ultimate Bundle, all about working with using GitHub Actions and Azure Pipelines, um, either or, uh, to in SharePoint framework projects to automate the build, testing, and deployment process of your SharePoint framework-based uh, apps. But that's not why you tuned in today. Today, you tuned in for Microsoft Teams. Now, before we dive into this, into too much of this, I wanna give you a little bit of an overview on why should you pay attention to me uh, as a, um, uh, in this webinar, and why should you listen to me in terms for the, the Microsoft 365 development? Well, um, did I lose that slide? No, I didn't, okay. So what is, um, what is the what are we what is the certification? What does it cover? Well, there's five different workloads, and we're going to talk about what the certification is, what you need to be able to to achieve the certification. Um, and today, we're going to focus on one of the workloads that you need to that you need to um, uh, you need to be versed in to be able to become certified. Um, before we go too much into this webinar, I do want to just remind you, um, if you haven't tuned in to any of the previous ones, while there is a chat feature in, in our uh, webinar and you're welcome to use that, um, I'm not staying on top of the chat as much. Please feel free to post your questions to the question and answer panel. Um, I will keep an, I have been keeping an eye on that. I will try to answer questions as they're relevant as we're going through the content, but if they're not relevant, or if they are kind of um, not relevant to the specific thing we're talking about at that time, then I'll tackle those questions um, at the very end. And now that I look at the camera, I can see that my face is all white on one side because the sun just came out. So uh, sorry about that. Um, all right, so we got uh, five different workloads that you're gonna be tested on uh, for the Microsoft 365 Certified Developer. You've got Azure Identity, which is really just Azure AD. You got Microsoft Graph, you've got SharePoint, You've got Microsoft Teams and you've got Office add-ins. Now this webinar series, we're doing all five of these workloads and we are in, we've now reached the Microsoft Teams section of uh, this uh, of this series. Um, you may be wondering, why should you be listening to me to talk to you about this stuff? Well, the reason why is because I was involved in helping Microsoft develop the certification um, and I've taken the exam and I've passed the exam and I, there's my proof that I passed the exam. Um, I took a beta version of the exam back in February of uh, 2020, and I passed. Um, but it is a uh, it, the exam that I took is a little bit different from what you guys are, would take if you took it today. Um, and the reason why is because as a beta, they were really what they're really trying to do is they're trying to get people to answer the questions or to take the exam and answer the questions. 
Um, and in doing that, what it what 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 it does, it helps them um, understand uh, people who should be passing the exam. Why are they not passing it, and vice versa? Um, and so it tells them if they have good questions or bad questions and stuff like that that they need to address um, and fix up. Um, but for the most part, the exam that I took is going to be very similar, if not identical, to the one that you're going to take. Um, you have to. You have to, pa to, to, in order to become certified, you have to pass the exam at a 70% or higher. So you have to get 700 out of 1,000 points um, or something higher than 700. Here's how I did on it. You can see based between the different uh, workloads, um, some workloads I was stronger at than others. And the reason why I share this is because you don't have to be an expert at all five of these different workloads. Um, as you can see here, one of them, I was clearly deficient in Office add-ins compared to, say, my experience with SharePoint or Microsoft Graph or Microsoft Identity uh, or even Teams in this case. So um, please, you know, don't feel like you have to, to, to nail this stuff um, right when, uh, uh, that you actually have to nail it and you have to get, um, you have to be an expert at all of these different technologies. Don't don't think that at all because that's not the case. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit here about the exam um, itself. So the the way that this works, the way Microsoft does their certifications, especially for developers, is they're looking to measure you on one of five different three different levels. Um, it's the foundational level, it's the fundamental or the associate level, and it's the expert level. Now, Microsoft has their definitions for it. Let me explain what, what I, how I see their definitions and how they relate to the certification uh, for, that you need to pass for the Microsoft 365 Certified Developer Associate. So foundational is someone who is, think of them like a technical pre-sale, someone who they know the technology, but they maybe can't go implement it on their own. So I could walk in, like for example, if my car was, was broken down, then I could walk into a mechanic and we could have a conversation. He could say, well, this is wrong and this is wrong. And I could say, well, here's the problems that are going on. I think it's the alternator or I think it's this is broken and here's why. I can speak the speak. I can maybe you know, tell him here's what needs to be done. But I've got no experience in being able to do those things. He's the expert. He's the one that ha that's got the experience to do it. So an associate or foundational level is someone who can who can talk about the technology and they know the capabilities and they can maybe like design on a whiteboard a solution to what you're trying to achieve, but they may not be able to actually do it. Um, the next kind of, uh, of knowledge level that, you're gonna be that you can be tested at is the associate level. And the associate level is someone who is, has four years of experience in this technology and should be able to go through and do this stuff on their own. Um, in the case of in, in the case of, of this certification that we're doing, clearly that's not verbatim because Microsoft Teams and SharePoint Framework, they haven't been around for four years. So it's impossible to say you got four years of experience. But the idea is, is that you have that kind of level of experience. You don't have to have that exact experience, but you have to have that kind of background. And somebody that's an associate, I should be able to hire that person and then have her get put on a project and be able to go implement a solution that I give her without having to, you know, to stand over her shoulder and to help and explain, here's how this works and that works. They've got the experience to do it. The associate level is what they're testing you for. That's the level that you're supposed to be at for the Microsoft 365 Certified Developer Associate. That's the certification um, that they're doing. And you can see a link there in the middle of the slide that refers to the certification um, itself. The expert level is someone that is all the way at the high level. They're the ones that need to be able to do, um, they need to be able to know how to do everything, right? They need to know how to, to um, uh, not only be able to, to, to do the technology, to, to implement a solution using the technology that's provided to them, but they're also someone who's got a level of experience and knowledge that they could teach someone, okay? They can go even further. You are not being tested at the expert level, okay? The kind of questions that you're going to see that are APIs or code related questions, everything is multiple choice. You're not going to be asked to code anything. The nice thing about this is that what you are going to be asked to do is you may be given some code and be and ask, what does this do and give a bunch of options? 
Or you may say, how would you do this? And then they give you some code options and you have to choose the one that makes the, that is uh, the correct answer. Or you choose the one that would not solve the problem. It depends on what the question says. That's the kind of stuff that you're getting asked. So when I keep referring to an exam and a cert, the certification or the cert, the certification, think of that as like your trophy for passing the exam. The exam is that first link you see there on the slide. That's the MS 600. Okay. That's the MS 600 exam. That's the one that you're going to end up having to pass. Okay. Seeing a couple questions come in on the chat. Make sure you guys post them to the QA manager because I'm not, I, I'm not going to be able to, to focus on the chat because there's a lot of stuff. There's people kind of chat back and forth and send me like private messages and stuff. And it's hard to keep up with that and filter out the questions. That's what a QA panel is for. All right. Um, so, and hey, if you're watching the recording of this uh, in some time in the future, uh, you uh, are more than welcome to post a question in the comments at the bottom of the uh, uh, page where this recording is posted. Okay, speaking of that, what are we covering today? Well, this webinar series, I have a six part webinar series that we're running the entire month of May, and it is all about the certification. The first five, are all about the workloads. We are on Microsoft Teams, so we are on episode four of uh, the uh, of the series. I've got two more next Tuesday on May the uh, 19th and next Thursday on May the 21st. Those are gonna cover the last workload, Office add-ins, and then we're gonna do a little, have a little bit of fun. We're gonna go behind the scenes and see what does it take for Microsoft to what are they, what's involved with them in building an, a certification? What do you what how, what was the experience like? What was my involvement like? Stuff like that. Bring your questions if you're curious about that stuff. More than happy to, to share it with you. I'll even share with you what it was like in uh, taking the exam from home and how they do all the stuff they do to make sure you don't cheat. They do a really good job. Okay, um, and hey, I'll also share with you some of my insights too on this. I was someone in the past where I always thought these certifications were not terribly great because I'm like, you know, the people that write the questions, they don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, the questions, they just put them out there and no one's really making sure that they're good questions and um, there's no oversight. I will tell you what, I'll explain to you what they do behind the scenes. And it's, it's impressive. I, I totally changed my perspective on it once I walked out of there. Uh, and I walked, once I walked out of that experience uh, in 2019. Okay, if you missed any of the previous ones, including if you um, wanna watch the one that we're doing right now, um, go to the link that you see there on the bottom of the slide, the vtns.io uh, get M365 dev certified series. Um, that is going to cover, uh, it has links to all the future webinars that I'm doing uh, for this series and where you can register for them. And it will also, I'm also updating that post every time we, we publish the recording for the webinar as well. So all the previous three webinars have already been recorded, they've already been published and they're available for viewing um, on demand. All right, so, oh man, why does that say SharePoint at the top? That's supposed to say Teams. So in fact, I'm gonna change that really quick because that's just dumb. Oh, oh and that's wrong too, T-E-A, there we go. Gee, many Christmas. So let's go back, let's do that. And it looks like I got a fix. Uh, it's not sharing my slide. So hold on, let's just double, let's just fix that really briefly. Uh, let's see. So that is, if I'm not mistaken, that is supposed to be, oh, the screen is frozen. And that's what it should be showing, right? Yeah, that's what it should be showing. Okay, cool. All right, now, okay, so what do you what what's up with the Microsoft Teams section? We're going to cover that right now. So what the Microsoft Teams section of the certification is going to it covers um, it co takes up about fifteen to twenty percent of the exam. And the reason why that's a variable in there is because there's a pool of questions for each one of these different workloads, and not you're not going to get questions from all of them. Okay. Um, you're not going to get all. You're not going to get questions. You're not going to get all the team's questions. You're going to get some of them. You get a subset. So if you go take the exam and I go take the exam, we may not get the exact same questions, right? And that's why you really the, the the cheating aspect to it. You just you shouldn't even try. I mean, you should know this stuff. There's a reason why you need to know this stuff. Um, as far as the technologies go, what kind of things are going to be you know aside from Microsoft Teams? What do you need to know? 
all of the questions related to Microsoft Teams are all gonna be using the JavaScript SDK. And all of the, the background stuff is all based on Node.js. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm almost positive that 100% of it is all TypeScript based. And the reason why they did that is they wanted to go with the biggest audience of people who are not just you know, .NET Core people. So they went with um, Node.js and TypeScript and maybe in the future they'll have other versions of the exam that focus on other technologies. But they figure, hey, you've already got to know TypeScript for a lot of the other stuff that you're going to do, like SharePoint Framework and um, Office add-ins. So they would, did the same thing with Microsoft Teams. Um, some things you can completely ignore that you don't need to worry about as far as underlying technologies is ignore web frameworks. So like, for example, in Microsoft Teams, um, you can use uh, React. And you may be familiar with, at least today, at the time we're talking about this and recording this webinar, the story about the UI controls is kind of in flux. We had the stuff that Teams, the Teams group originally published. We had the stuff that um, it then morphed over to using their, their recommendation towards the end of 2019 was to use the library Stardust, which was a themable uh, React controls. And since then, they're now saying, no, you want, we want you to use Fluent, um, the Fluent UI. And uh, just so you know, that it's the Fluent UI is Stardust. It's just they're merging Fluent kind of office uh, UI fabric. They're merging all that stuff together. You don't need to know this, okay? You don't need, they're not gonna test you on those controls. They're only gonna test you on the Microsoft Teams specific stuff. You may see some stuff in a question that, that, show, that looks like there's some fluent or uh, stuff in there, some UI stuff or some Reacty stuff in there, but it's not something you have to know as part of the tech, okay? You don't, you're not gonna be quizzed on that. So you don't have to worry about knowing that stuff. Now, um, there is a um, some self-paced learning uh, that is available. If you want to get up to speed on Microsoft Teams, I would highly recommend it because I wrote it. <laughs> um, but it's it's available today, it's published, and it's at that link that you see there um, at the bottom of the slide. All right, so let's talk about the topics that you're gonna need to know with this. Surprise, I'm getting hardly any questions with this. Um, I got, let's see, one question came in. Is the version of .NET Core the 3.1 version? Sorry if it's off topic. Uh, I think we are, I think I just answered that one, Jim. Um, that is not, it's not at all pertinent to this module, uh, or sorry, to this workload. Um, but I believe all of the, any other questions that you would have on the exam from other workloads, they will, um, they will be, um, uh, they, they, when they use .NET Core, they will use either 3.0 or 3.1. .NET Core 3.0 or 3.1, 3.0, I should say. Um, I see somebody asked about going back to the last slide for that link uh, for the recordings. Don't worry about it. I'm going to get it to the very end. Let's. We're developers. In a cloud world, you fail forward. You don't revert back. You always fail forward. We'll come back to it, Michael. You'll get another chance to get the link. Okay. Now... Let's talk about the, the, some of the things you need to know. So one thing you need to know are the components of a Teams app. So what does that mean? You need to understand what it means to build a custom app for Microsoft Teams and what things are involved in doing that. You're gonna have an app manifest. That manifest is going to be uh, the thing that, you, um, that defines all of the customizations that you are deploying to your, your custom, uh, your Microsoft Teams instance. Um, the, uh, let's see, um, you need to know, like, that's a manifest file, that manifest.json uh, file that's in the, that's in every single one of your apps. You also need to know a little bit of stuff about App Studio. So App Studio is an app that, it, that you can install. It's a, it's a Teams app that you can install in your Microsoft Teams instance. Um, from the store, from the team store. Um, everybody has access to it. And it allows you to do things like design cards, modify the, the, the app manifest, um, adding bots, uh, or adding a bot that you've built. It doesn't just, it's not a, like a bot builder or wizard. Um, adding tabs, stuff like that. Um, you also need to understand what are the different components inside of the app package that you're gonna deploy to Microsoft Teams. 
And the easy part there is you're only deploying three things, two different images for the different ways you can, it can be rendered and the manifest. It's kind of true. Teams is interesting. You're not really deploying anything to teams. You're simply making teams aware of stuff that lives outside. You have to host everything yourself, whether it's a bot, whether it's a messaging extension, whether it's a tab, everything lives outside of Microsoft Teams. Teams just loads your stuff. Um, you also need to understand the options for distributing a Teams app. I just went through that. You know, what things do you, where is stuff going to go? It, it, the only thing that really matters when you deploy something with Teams is it's got to be an, a routable HTTPS endpoint. That's, I mean, that's it. Um, it can't be on localhost. It can't be on localhost. That's one thing that we, we know we can't do. Um, so that makes development a little tricky, um, but there's ways to get around that. There's tools that you can use to get around that. Um, another thing you need to understand are the concept of what a deep link is and what a task module is. So. Um, a deep link, that's easy. That's when I want to create a link. And if I send it to you, it will launch Teams and maybe take you straight to a specific message. Or it'll take you straight to my tab. Or it'll take you straight to a task module. Right? That's a deep link. That's going to get you into Teams and give you some context on what you're doing. How can you, what are the benefits to using uh, deep links? How do you use them? And then a task module, what is that? Task modules, I mean... Uh, you gotta love Microsoft, right? They come up with a name for everything, even if it doesn't even need a name. They come up with a name for it. Um, and the Teams group is no different. A task module is just a dialogue. So it's how we do dialogues in Microsoft Teams. Well, why didn't they call it a dialogue? Because marketing guys are bored, right? And they, gotta, they, gotta, they have to justify their existence. It drives me crazy. But hey, that's Microsoft. I can't, you can't drive that. All right. Another question, another thing that comes up, you need to understand the topic of webhooks in Microsoft Teams. There are three different types of webhooks, really two, but like they're, the second one is like an A and a B. So there's two different ways you can do webhooks. Um, there is an outgoing webhook. So, so first of all, you need to understand when would you use them? Why would you use them and when would you use them? And I would almost argue that this should be like the last thing you should study, right? Because this is like the easy way of doing like a bot in a way. So what an outgoing webhook is, um, that's when, you, that's when you, uh, you set up Microsoft Teams to say that whenever you mention my app, I want you to do an HTTP post to this endpoint and it's some web service that I've created. Um, the opposite of that is an incoming webhook and that is, you register that in Teams. Teams gives you a URL, an endpoint, and then from your custom app that you build, you do an HTTP post to that endpoint and it will add that as a message in Microsoft Teams. And there's some security stuff around that and everything that you have to do. Um, same thing with outgoing. A And then the third type or like 2B of uh, incoming webhooks is something called an Office 365 connector. And what that is, is that is simply a way for you, it makes, it makes creating the incoming webhook a little bit easier and a little more wizard D, not wizardry, but wizard D, you know, no, no R in there. Um, and what I mean by that is like when you do an incoming webhook, you have to go register it and then they give you the endpoint and then you've got to take that endpoint and go register it in your external web service or external app so it knows where to make the post to. Um, and that's all a manual process. A Office 365 connector is something that you can deploy to your channel or to your team. And when you go to deploy it, you get in a configuration experience, which is just a web page. And when that web, when you save the configuration experience, you have the option to go grab the, that URL that they created and submit that over to your, to your app or your, your endpoint to save it with, so there's no manual interaction. It's a much more like power user friendly way of um, installing an internal, an incoming webhook. You should also understand what the limitations are of webhooks. The fact that they are only gonna be registered with a team on a team, a team by team basis, um, which is, it is a, it's a manual process to set those up and that's a pain. You also can't register those inside of your app manifest. So. Under, those are all these limitations and you can see like, okay, that may work for like a one-off, but then what if I want to do it 
in a much more repeatable fashion. Well, that's where some of the other things that we can do uh, that we that we can do. We'll come back. We'll come into those. Another thing you need to understand tabs. Hey, you know what? I totally forgot. I meant to ask you guys this question. A poll just showed up inside of inside of the um, the Zoom client. Would you let me know? Are you guys are you thinking about taking this exam? Are you definitely taking the exam? Are you not going to take it? Or have you already taken it? I don't know. Why would you watch this if you're already going to take it? Maybe you're evaluating this for maybe your friends. So I'm just curious how many of you are, are interested in taking um, this exam. And most people have voted. That's awesome. So it looks like we got like, here, let's do, let's go. Let me go ahead and end this. I'll give you uh, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. And we're shutting it down. Okay. Now, so check this out. 80% of you said, yes, you are planning on taking the exam. That's awesome. That, that I'm, I mean, I'm glad you're not wasting your time here. Um, 18% like, eh, maybe. Well, I wonder, do me a favor, put it in the chat or put it in the question. Wh why maybe? What's your concern? Like, is it, I don't know if I'm qualified for it or you don't have the experience or what is it? Hey, um, another pair of questions I would like to ask you. Um, so what about... Okay, now, this is a pair of questions, okay, that you're going to get. There's two of them in this poll. The first one, they're both asking you almost the same thing, but there's one difference between each one. The first one says, of all five of these workloads, Teams, Identity, Graph, SharePoint, at Office add-ins, which one do you have the most experience or are you the strongest at? And then the second question is the exact opposite. Which one are you have the least experience with or are you the weakest at? Okay. So just curious here. All right, cool. So interesting. So I'll let this go for, let's say another, let's go another five seconds. So four, three, two, one. All right, check this out. So you guys overwhelmingly have said that you're the strongest at SharePoint. And then a couple of you said identity. I'm like, nah, impressive. I said, that's, that is a, um, I don't know. Identity is an interesting one. I think I don't think identity is is that hard. I think that Microsoft has done a great job at making auth and identity hard. Um, I can't stand the way that they that they pitch it, but it is what it is. Um, the next thing, uh, another question was, what about the weakest? Where do you have the least experience with? Every webinar is saying the same thing. Office add-ins. I get it. Me too. You saw my scores at the beginning of this webinar. That's where I'm the weakest at too. Um, and then it's around some, a little bit of a, a balance between graph and identity. Okay, cool. Well, let's keep going then. We'll come back in just a bit. We have one, I have one more question I'll ask you a little bit later. All right, so the next, another technology that you need to be aware of with Microsoft Teams are tabs. And you wanna, you need to be aware of when would you use a tab and the different kinds of tabs. What are the different capabilities of tabs? You probably should be aware of the fact that they had old names and they have new names associated with them because the old names are what we use in the SDK and in the manifest and the APIs, whereas the new names is what all the docs say. So the new names are personal tabs and configurable tabs. And the old names are channel tabs and static tabs. Yeah. Okay. So you need to understand, oh, sorry, I kind of got that wrong. It was, it used to be configurable and static, and now it's channel and personal. That's what I meant. Um, so what you need to understand, what can you do with a personal tab? Not only what it says, what are the capabilities, but you kind of need to know what the limitations are too with it. I remember a question that talked about the limitations as well. Um, same thing related to channel tabs. How are they different from personal tabs? Compare and contrast, something like that. So you should be able to do, you should be able to answer compare and contrast personal tabs and channel tabs. And why is, why would you use one? What scenarios would you use one in and what scenarios would you use the other one in? Okay. Um, the nice thing is I don't, I don't think you can, you wouldn't really, um, you shouldn't have much of a hard decision trying to figure out which one you would use when presented with 
the option of creating tabs. Um, you also should understand uh, any requirements uh, related to tabs as they are for mobile clients because there are some additional requirements and there are also some challenges that you can run into when it comes to working with the mobile clients. I'd like for the mobile clients to kind of get finally get updated and support all the stuff we can have in the thick client in the browser or the, the desktop clients. But I'd also like for there not to be a global pandemic going on, as I'm sure everybody would. Okay, so now let's talk another technology that you need to know or another aspect, another configure customization you can do in Microsoft Teams. You need to understand messaging extensions. So you need to understand what are these, how to use them, where are they available, uh, what are their capabilities, and um, what are the different types. So um, messaging extensions, if, you, if um, you're not aware, um, these give you the ability to either augment an existing message, like in a conversation, um, or it gives you an ability to kind of pre-fill the compose box um, in, a, uh, in, in the Teams client. Um, so you have three different ways you can launch it, either from that command bar at the very top, you go to an existing message and you click the dot, 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 and open that up and you can pick the me uh, messaging extension you've created to trigger it. Um, or you can launch it from the little icons below the compose box at the bottom of the conversations or the chat tab, whatever it's called these days. Uh, there are two different kinds of messaging extensions. There's an action and a search messaging extension. You should know the difference between the two of those. You should understand how to use each one of them. Uh, what are the capabilities of a search command, of a search extension? Uh, what are the capabilities of a action command? You should know when you go to when you go to build one and you're using the JavaScript SDK, so it doesn't say this on the slide, but make sure you take a note of this. You should know what methods you're going to be implementing. And you should really also know if you are not using the SDK, how does your web service know that it's a messaging extension search or action command? In addition, you should also know how to use, how to respond or how to set up your extension or your response from the messaging extension using both just text-based responses and adaptive cards, right? Um, we just published a brand new module yesterday or two days, yesterday or two days ago. I think it was two days ago, whatever. We just published a new module to Microsoft, to, um, Microsoft Learn uh, about creating engaging uh, experiences or engaging messages with adaptive cards. So it's, that's a pretty good one. And it, one of the sections of that deals with Microsoft Teams. Um, let's see, uh, is that everything you need to know? Yeah, that's everything you should, I think that's about everything you're gonna need to know. Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, this is my last one. I love this picture. You should, this is how I envision when I'm talking to a bot. That's just this guy going in. I don't know why I envision it this way because he has no hands and no mouth. So I don't know how he's typing or doing like, you know, speaking, whatever he's doing. Um, or, or she. Um, so you need to understand uh, how bots work. Um, oh, there was actually one more thing I forgot that was related to messaging extensions and how under the covers you're using the bot framework to communicate between your web service that implements the extensions and the messaging extension in Microsoft Teams. As far as conversational bots go, you should also know that you're creating a web service and that web service is gonna communicate with Microsoft Teams through the bot framework that's hosted in Microsoft Azure. And that's a service that's available to you. Um, you should understand when to use, um, when to use conversational bots you should understand uh, when it does not make sense to create a bot um, conceptually when it doesn't make sense. Like if you've got a long, complicated experience, probably not the best thing to use a bot. Um, you should understand like when you're going to create a bot that maybe you don't want to always do a text-based bot. Maybe you want your bot to respond with adaptive cards. You should know how to do that. And you should know how to, from a bot, you should know how to launch a task module to collect information from a user in like a wizard experience. Um, you should know um, how to scope a bot, 
How do you make it available just to the personal scope? How do you make it available to a group chat or to a, uh, an entire channel uh, or team? Um, you should also know that, that when you do that, what are the implications or how do you talk to that bot if it's, a, if it's in the personal scope or if it's in the group chat scope or if it's in the team or channel scope? What is, how do you talk to it? When do you have to at mention it? When do you not have to at mention it? Those are all things that you need to know. Wow, you guys haven't asked hardly, you've only asked like two questions the entire time. This is amazing. Guess what? We may be finishing this webinar really early. Because that was my last slide, that's all the stuff that you need to know about Teams, right? So these main different things, task modules, messaging extensions, bots, tabs, and then the last one was uh, like the manifest and the tool and the app studio tool. So you need to understand how all that stuff works. Um, okay. So before I, before I, I go back, go over to questions. So if you got a question, now's a great time to post it because we're going to be running out of time uh, fairly soon. And we're not going to leave the webinar running just to fill up the entire hour. We're about 25 minutes we got 24 minutes left, so plenty of time to ask questions. Um, so first, uh, again, this is the slide I showed earlier. So it was a quick little rehash. This is um, all of the different, um, uh, these are all of the different um, uh, webinars and that we're doing in this, the, all the different episodes we're doing in this webinar series um, around each one of the different workloads. So the three previous ones, the recording has already been published and is available for you guys to go take a look at. Um, this one for Microsoft Teams, um, I hope to actually publish it a little bit earlier, um, than I did, than I've done it in the past. Um, I think I might be able to, because if you can't tell that the webinar is being, it looks a little bit different from the previous ones. And I'm actually, using some different uh, software to uh, deliver it. And it should allow me to, I think I have a recording locally. I won't know until we stop it. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get going in just a minute. Um, and then uh, for the future webinars that we're doing um, on next Tuesday, we're gonna talk about office add-ins, um, which I would expect you're gonna get a, we're gonna have a pretty big crowd for that one, considering most every webinar we've done, people are like, that's the one I know the least about. Um, and then the one we'll do next Thursday, I'm looking forward to that one. I keep getting all these questions about behind the scenes and, and stuff about the, the, um, uh, behind the scenes of the, uh, building the certification and what that was like and how Microsoft does it. Um, because it's interesting. I always think that whenever you, whenever you, whenever you are trying to learn something, when you understand somebody's motivation and how they did stuff, it gives you the best perspective on how to deal with it. Right, so I'm a SharePoint framework guy, and I find that when I understood what Microsoft's motivations were for introducing the SharePoint framework, a lot of stuff got a lot easier. Um, if you need links for go to register for any of the webinars or to watching the recordings, that link is there at the bottom of the slide. I will leave that up um, while we're answering questions, so you guys can take a look at it. Um, one other thing I do want to ask. Uh, before uh, we get close to wrapping this up, I, got, I see a bunch of questions have come in, so we'll come we'll come back to that. Um, is uh, so I'm uh, actively exploring uh, when I finish the current course that I'm working on, the SharePoint Framework uh, Development course, is creating a boot camp uh, for people who want to get ramped up and um, pass the MS 600 exam. Um, and what I'm curious on, if you wouldn't mind just giving me your opinion here, I've asked this question I know a bunch of times, is that something you'd be interested in? Um, it is not gonna be, it's, you know, people will keep asking this question, let me just go ahead and answer the questions I, I, I asked about this. Um, it is not gonna be a gigantic, like, you know, 20 hour course, it's not gonna be something like that. The goal is, is that I want you to be able to, you'd be able to watch the entire course and no more than a day um, but you may have some, a lot of studying that you have to do and a lot of stuff that you need to get up to speed on. You won't just be able to watch the course and then go take it. And the reason why is because I'm going to take advantage of a lot of, of a lot of free content that's already out there. And instead of, you know, saying the same thing that you can get for free, I'm going to make the course a little bit shorter and be able to charge a lot less for it. How much is it going to be? Everyone asked that. 
I'm not entirely sure. I'm shooting for a price you know, below $250. I think it's gonna be below 200. I don't know. We'll see when I get there. I haven't, I haven't spent the time really scoping it out yet um, and exactly how it's gonna be uh, built up and everything. So cool. Thank you guys very much for your feedback on that. I really do appreciate that. All right, let's do some questions. Holy moly, look at the chat. Chat just went crazy uh, pretty quick. I'm gonna go in, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna focus on the questions first. So Michael asked about that link. So there's the link on the slide that you can grab um, for watching, um, for getting the previous recordings. So that's one that we just did. Um, Andrew B, um, what do they mean by deploying a bot into a one-to-one -one static channel in the context of an IT help desk? Oh, so when you deploy a bot in uh, like to one-on-one, -on -one, um, that's a personal, uh, that goes in the personal scope or used to be known as the static scope or the static a static tab. Um, that's when you are having a conversation with the bot. You're not having a conversation with the bot like in a in the conversations tab where everybody else in the channel can see it um, or in a group chat. A one-on-one -on -one is just you going back and forth with the bot. So yeah, maybe a help desk or something like that, but nobody else can see it. Um, Andrew, uh, Andrew A, sorry, Michael A, um, can you speak to who Microsoft thought would be the target of the certification? Who would get certified and what would they do with it? So, um, I'll go into this a little bit more next Thursday, but I'll, to, I'll answer your question now as well. So the reason Microsoft came up with this certification, um, companies and their customers were asking Microsoft for some way to be able to measure and to, to validate that people, uh, that, it, that someone was capable of doing M365 development work. They wanted that certification not only for their own employees, but they wanted it also for um, people that they were hiring. So I what I should be able to do is that if I need to go hire someone to do Microsoft 365 development work, maybe it's on Office add-ins, maybe it's on Teams, maybe it's on SharePoint, but I, you know, whatever it is, I should be able to hire them and know that if they are certified, then I feel comfortable that they know enough to be able to, um, they know enough to be productive and to be able to build solutions. Um, if they did, were not certified, then I really don't know if they just say that they know it and they don't really know it. So it was, this is mainly driven based on customer um, demand. Um, customers were asking Microsoft for this. Um, you know what, let's do, let's do this there. Okay. I answer questions this way. Um, so that's the main thing of why they were, of why they were doing, why they set this up. Okay. They wanted to make sure that, um, people were, uh, had certain technical capabilities when they were going to get a job and for companies to be able to evaluate those people, um, at that level. So who is really designed for it? It's if you're doing work, development work around Teams or SharePoint um, or Office add-ins, well, you're, you're going to be doing something with Microsoft Graph. That's the API to everything inside of Microsoft 365. And everything is, is founded on Azure AD. That's the common denominator. So I know that if I hire you, you know Azure AD and you know Microsoft Graph, or at least you're, you know enough about it um, to where you can be productive and I don't need to, I don't need to train you up on graph or, or Azure AD, uh, based development. Um, what it doesn't do is it doesn't, I mean, it very, I very well could hire somebody that is Microsoft 365 development certified and they know nothing about SharePoint because the certification, it, it, it enables that there's up to 25% of the questions on the exam are going to be related to SharePoint, or as we saw today, up to 20% of the questions can be on Microsoft Teams. You can get a zero on the team section or on the SharePoint section and still pass. So there's a little bit of that you kind of have to, you do have to know. All right, Rude has a question. Um, I don't have a lot of hands-on with Teams. Is Teams also available in a demo tenant? Yes, uh, Teams is. Um, I don't know if you have to enable it in the admin center, but yeah, it's available in the demo tenant. It's just like SharePoint, it's definitely available. Uh, like the Microsoft Partner Tenant? Yes. Yes, it definitely is. In fact, that's all you need to be able to study for this. Um, you will need a, what do you need? If you needed to go through and, and to get up, ramped up on the team section, you will need a Microsoft 365 Tenant 
um, you will need an internet connection, um, a text editor, uh, like I would recommend VS Code. A um, couple things installed on your machine. It's very minor, like, uh, let's see, Node, Yeoman, Gulp. Don't, don't worry about writing this down. This is all like written down somewhere else. But um, this is all written down like when you need to, if you want to get up to speed on Teams development. Uh, let's see, Node.js, Yeoman, Gulp, and the Microsoft Teams Yeoman generator. Um, you need to have all that stuff installed. Um, furthermore, you will also need an Azure subscription because that's how you create bots. Now there is a way to create a bot without an Azure subscription that they don't really, none of the labs and the self-paced stuff really focuses on that. The docs don't really focus on it too much. You need an Azure subscription. In my opinion, you need an Azure subscription. And it's just when you go to create bots and uh, messaging extensions. Now, with that being said, don't worry about spending any money on it. Not only do you get $200 credit free in the first month of Azure, you won't even use that. Because to create an Azure subscription, you have to provide a valid credit card. And then once you do that, you can create resources. But when you go to create um, a bot, there is a free tier, I think it's the F0 tier, that gives you, I think, 10,000 messages for free. Um, the next tier up just gives you a certain SLA uh, with the uh, with those messages, and you don't need you don't need the one to pay you don't need the paid one at all. You can do everything to study for this exam, and to 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 prepare for it and practice. You can do everything with zero dollars, except for what you spend on your internet connection and your developer workstation, like how much you spend on your laptop. Right, that's it. Which, if you think about it, that's pretty that's pretty awesome. I mean, go back five ten years ago and you spent we spent a lot more like you want to be able to do sharepoint development oh sorry you're gonna to have to go get an msdn subscription it's like it's a great it's a great story um rune's got a question will there be a part on yo teams like sharepoint framework now that it's available um there is so i don't think you're gonna get a question about yo teams but none of the materials that are available to you for the self-paced study, none of those materials are um, are going to use Visual Studio. Everything uses Yo Teams. Um, I can say that with certainty because I wrote all the material. But uh, so I was involved in writing the, the self-paced study content and recording the self-paced study content for the certification, which is why when I build my own course. I'm not going to re-record all that stuff and try and sell it to you because it's already out there for free. I mean, it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, I see a lot of stuff going on in the chat. I got a bunch of questions. I'm going through the questions, so I'm not watching the chat, guys. Just FYI. If you got a question, make sure you post it in the chat. I see some people actually helping each other. So that's cool. Sharing is caring. Uh, let's see. So Anonymous, didn't know we had a hacker group in here. Um, said, for someone with not much experience, what would be the best way to start? Things move very quickly in the Office 365 world. So by the time we learn something and uncomfortable, it's already outdated. Yeah, but the certification is not going to change that frequently. So I wouldn't be worried about keeping up, right? I wouldn't be worried about that. Like, for example, I think the Teams um, Manifest SDK just changed to version 1.6. You won't get any questions about that and the stuff that's on there. Um, you won't get any questions about like you can now do personal apps using the SharePoint framework in Microsoft Teams. No questions on that. That just that just came out a couple weeks, months, two, three ago. You won't get any questions on that. So what's the best way to start? I would go through all the self-paced content. If you go through all the self-paced study content that Microsoft provides and you are comfortable with all of that content, you will be comfortable passing the exam, okay? Because that's all I did. I didn't study at all for the content, for the exam. I focused on going through all the self-paced content, which, I mean, I, I wrote it, so I was familiar with all of it. Um, and then I went and took the exam and I was fine. Um, Joseph, how does how does the development cycle task that we do differ developing and testing for teams? Differ from what, Joseph? 
Um, I create my own site collection in SharePoint. What's the equivalent in Teams development? Oh, okay. So you 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 are probably going to create a test a team where you can do all your testing. Um, you can create channels in that. So think of that as like creating a site collection and then creating different lists. Um, a list is like these are very loose analogies. So someone's like, no, that's not true. I I know. So a a, a team is like a site collection creating different lists. Those are in SharePoint, that's like creating different channels um, because you can delete them and get rid of the messages. Um, it's it, But other than that, it's very similar. You build something, you package it up, you deploy it to some sort of a distribution model. In SharePoint, we use app catalogs. In Teams, we use the app store. Um, you then have to go install the SharePoint site collection, the SharePoint app in your SharePoint site and you do that by going installing an app. You do the exact same thing in Teams. You install an app and it's gonna give you a list of all the apps that are available to you, including the ones that you've deployed to um, the store. Um, you have a store that's local just for your tenant. Um, and um, you have a store that's available just for your tenant and you have the global store, SharePoint Framework. You've got the global store and you've got one that is just for your tenant or even your site collection. You can scope it even down that farther. Um, one thing that is different from SharePoint to um, Teams development is that everything you do in Teams, you have to host it. So in development, you host it on your laptop, but in production, you got to deploy it somewhere that Teams can get to it. Um, in SharePoint, we can put our JavaScript and manifest files in the package and they can get deployed to a CDN for us. That does not exist inside Teams. You team, A Teams app is kind of like... I, I, when I was building the content, working on the cert, I was joking around with the guy that, that owned the dev story. And his point was, there's really no such thing as a Teams app because a Teams app is just a manifest file that just is a bunch of pointers saying, there's a bot over there and there's a bot over here and there's a messaging extension. And that tab, that's really just a web page that is gonna be running from a site that you host. And we're just gonna have an iframe that loads it. That task module, that's either an adaptive card that you gave us from your external application, or it's a web page that you're hosting in your application that we're loading in an iframe. So that's some of the differences. Um, Warren, will I be creating your own my own sample app to go with your bootcamp material, an end-to-end -end integrated application across SharePoint and Teams? No, I will not be doing that. And the reason why is because it's not necessary. These reference implementations get so big and so contrived. Um, if you notice, you don't see Microsoft doing this stuff all that much anymore. Um, years ago, if I mean, you've been doing this as long as I have, you may be familiar with like, um, remember the Finch and Matter uh, books or the, the Financial Company or um, Adventure Works Bicycles. You'd have these big applications that they would build and the second that you would deploy them, they take a lot of time to build. It's like a real production app and you deploy it and you get everything up and running. And after you end up doing that, you... Um, you, somebody's gonna, another customer will come to you and say, yeah, that's not really my scenario. What if I wanted to do this? And so it never really works. So instead it's just, you know, how can I integrate these different pieces together and how can I build up on it? The idea is to build like maybe a couple components together. Like I'll build a bot and that bot will return back a task module to show that. And then the task module I click on, it, it'll take me to, um, to a tab, a custom tab, but there's no like, you know, big scenario. You get some of that now these days with like a hero, they call them a hero demo for a conference um, that they show in like keynotes. But, you know, I'm not going to build one because the maintenance of them too is just, it, it makes them cost prohibitive. Um, they get out of date and someone's like complaining, oh, you're using a version that's like six months old. You need to update it. And that takes a lot of time. And so, no, I don't, I don't, I don't find that to be, in my experience of doing like developer education for the last, 13 years, um, they don't, there's no, the, the payoff isn't there. I get it. I get the request and I get, uh, yeah, but I really do get value from that. I totally respect that. I get it. I do too. I love grabbing those big samples and then being able to poke through it. Um, but what we see the vast majority of people, it's not worth, it's not worth the investment. Um, Michael P, do you know, do you know if there are any plans for more in-depth exams specific to workloads like Teams? I can tell you right now that there is nothing currently 
I need to be careful what I say here. <laughs> the last time I was involved in working on the exam, there was one exam planned, and that is the MS-600. And there was one certification planned, and that was the certification we're talking about here, the Microsoft 365 Developer Associate Certification. If you can read between the lines on that response, It's not so much an NDA thing. It's that I remember the discussions we had about this. So, okay, I've got two questions left. I can answer those. Those are those are quick ones. So let me give you a little bit more background into this. And I was going to go into this. I'm going to go into this a lot more in the in my behind the scenes webinar a week from today. When they were designing the certification, the idea was associate across the board, associate level knowledge on all five workloads. The problem is, is that when they create an exam, they also have to create an instructor led course that will that that you that a company could send an employee to. They go through the course as a green developer and they come out the other end and can take the exam and pass it if they did if they applied themselves during the course. My argument was. If you're going to do that, then you your course is going to be about three weeks long. Um, when they originally spec'd it, and here the reason why I wasn't involved in the instructor led course, to be completely blunt, um, is because uh, the course had to be four or five days long, which meant that you had to do you had to learn everything SharePoint framework in about a day, maybe a day and a half. No chance, no chance at all. That's going to happen. My, my SharePoint framework development course is over 30 hours long. There's no way you can do that in one day. I was like, at best, maybe three or four days, but that's just one of the five workloads. So I th that's why I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the instructor-led course. That was a, the main reason. So what we ended up having to do was it wasn't associate across the board. You actually are gonna be tested associate level at the, the graph and the identity level. And then there's going to be, uh, and then it's more found, it's a mix of like foundational plus or like associate minus kind of knowledge that you're going to be tested at for the, the specific products, Teams, SharePoint, and Office add-ins. Um, and in the future, they, they were thinking about, well, then we can have an associate level training or associate level course for SharePoint. So there'll be a Microsoft 365 certified associate developer. And then you could also go get a SharePoint like emphasis or a team's emphasis, stuff like that, okay? Um, but the core was all of those three still require identity and graph. So that's the that's the one that's probably the deepest at. Those two are the deepest that you need to know. So hopefully that answers your question. I hope they do another one. I think that they should. But frankly, when we were doing this stuff last year, it was, it was, a, it was a strictly a budget thing. It was strictly a budget thing and a time thing. Um, this certification had to launch by Ignite of last year. I will give you more behind the scenes stuff in my behind the scenes webinar. Let me get to these last two questions that we've got here. Um, Andrew, do sites have to be groupified before they are teamified? I'll put it this way. I'm going to answer this. I'm not 100% confident in my answer. And I'll explain, I'll, I'll explain my reasoning on how I'm going to answer it in a second. But just because of that, you, I can tell you that you don't have to worry about that for the exam, okay? Um, the only way a site, the only way, the only way you can, the only thing you can teamify is a group. So if you have a SharePoint site that is not an Office 365 group, then I assume you're going to have to groupify it first before you can teamify it. Because when you even look in the APIs, there's nothing that lets you teamify a SharePoint site, only a group. Joseph, can the host for a Teams app actually be SharePoint or I have to have Azure or some other equivalent? So um, it can be SharePoint because if you're familiar on the, well, so actually your, your name is familiar. You're actually, I think you're actually one of our, one of my customers for the SharePoint framework course. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the, well, I'm not, I, I'm not, I know I'm not mistaken. I've done this. Um, in the SharePoint framework, they have ways of going through and extending uh, customizations that can be used in Teams. So like, for example, 
you can create a tab for Microsoft Teams. If you do it the 100% Teams native way of doing it, you're creating a web page that you're gonna host somewhere like an Azure app or some other equivalent. Um, if you're doing it in, um, if you're doing it in uh, uh, SharePoint, you can create a web part and deploy that as a Teams app, a Teams tab. And what happens is, is there's a central page in SharePoint that when it gets a specially crafted uh, URL with all these URL parameters on it, it you will also get, um, uh, you will also get, um, oh, what is it? You get um, uh, the, the tab, the, the web part is added to the page, but there's no SharePoint Chrome on the page. So it's actually being loaded from SharePoint. Um, you can do that with um, personal uh, tabs and you can do that with um, personal apps um, as well. All right, cool. So we are at we are at the, I always forget this, top or bottom of the hour. We're at the end of the hour. So let me, uh, let's see, let's go back and let me show that slide again. Uh, so you can grab that link if you need it. Let me just quickly just scan the chat really quick if there's anything quick. Any questions? Not option, web hooks, unless you know and ask. Depending on what's available, don't want to tell others. Bootcamp. Uh, got a question about uh, from Mark about a recommendation for a dev laptop setup should include. What do you think you need? Um, I have a three-year-old MacBook Pro that I use for everything. I, I personally, I'm not. A, I don't like Windows, um, and this machine is awesome. It's what I'm running off of right now, and it's fantastic. Streaming video, streaming a webinar. The fans are running on it, but it's running. It's it, I, that's that's my favorite machine. Um, but my two cents. Um, yeah, Michael, I always screw that up. I know I, bottom is always like bottom is at the six. So it's at the half past. And yeah, cool. All right. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I hope everyone ha learned something today. I hope to see you next Tuesday for office add-ins. I saw one or two other questions about how do you take the exam? Any tips and stuff like that? Come to behind the scenes. It's a great place to ask that question. And I will see everybody then. Hey, thanks a lot for joining me today. I really appreciate it. The recording will be up hopefully later today. Take care, everybody.